I'm Jack Powers, and I'm going to be reading from my book entitled Pacing the Cage. Pacing the Cage, Chapter 1. In the beginning, the airlift to USP Leavenworth is a bit of a trip. In its own way, though, it is fun. We get to see the country, eat those prepackaged meat, cheese, and cracker thingies, and meet other prisoners. The U.S. Marshal Service came to get me out of the Hillsborough County Jail in Tampa, Florida on a Friday and took me up to the county jail in Hernando County, somewhere north of Tampa, for the weekend before the airlift. It is September of 1990, and I have already been locked up for nearly two years in the county jail. I am more than ready to move on to whatever comes next. They take me upstairs to some sort of a medical area and position a small desk in front of the cell. It is weird because the cell front is all safety glass, and there are females all over the place. There's a female prisoner in a cell diagonal from mine. She is young and very buxom, and she has my full attention. We cannot hear each other because of the glass, but we manage to communicate with our hands and body expressions. On Saturday night, she gets up on a steel stool attached to her small steel desk, a position where I can see her quite well, and she begins to give me quite a show. This is a devious kind of torture that twists and turns something deep in my gut. The guard in front of my cell and another woman comes and goes. She has to know what is going on, but she pointedly ignores me and it and them. I begin to think that this must be an arranged scenario, but I am unable to form a complaint. Two U.S. Marshals picked me up in a sedan early Monday morning. I gave the hygiene items I had to the mysterious girl and wore my necklace, watch, and ring. I was dressed in the same suit of clothes I had worn at the sentencing some weeks earlier. This would be the last time for many upcoming years that I would feel like a real human being. There was another person going on the airlift, and he sat beside me but did not talk much. We parked on the hot tarmac to wait for the plane to come down from the sky. The marshal in the driver's seat turned around and handed us mailing envelopes. U.S. Marshal, anything of value you fellas want to keep, put it in the envelope there and address it to where you want it sit. Powers, they won't let us take our things on the airlift? U.S. Marshal, no way, only your clothing and shoes. Money, jewelry, wallets, and all that sort of stuff has to be sent home. Powers. Yeah, but there is no receipt with this. U.S. Marshal. You guys can seal those envelopes. We don't even know what's inside. We carry them directly to the post office and see that they're mailed. No one's going to rip you off. The guy next to me is obviously a Colombian drug dealer of some medium level in the pecking order on the streets of Tampa. And he has a lot of gold jewelry he is stuffing into the envelope. I follow along and put my watch, ring, and necklace into the envelope. They are nowhere near as valuable as Columbia's assets are, but they are nice pieces nevertheless. I address it to my mom, seal the envelope, and hand it to the marshal. The plane has already landed and is pulling up to park close by. It is a 727 that is all white except for numbers on the tail wing. A gaggle of both marked and unmarked federal vehicles, including ours, creep into place in a close semicircle. We go through an elaborate routine, pat downs, questions, paperwork checks, hand signals, and more, waiting before boarding the airplane. The interior is quiet, and the temperature is cooler than outside. I shuffle down the aisle, past maybe 15 or 20 females, 
and go to the seat pointed out by an air marshal. If prisoners could sit where they wanted to, I would have preferred sitting near the front. The thing that got me, though, was the fact that the females were all in chains, like I was. Something about that seemed very wrong to me. Women get caught up in the so-called criminal justice system in large numbers. They usually have a boyfriend who is dealing drugs or is a member of some street gang or otherwise involved in a life of crime, and they get caught up in it themselves. Historically, the female prisoner slash defendant was given a good degree of leniency, but not in these days. Female offenders are the fastest growing demographic in the system, and the main reason is that they provide more bodies in cages. This, of course, means job security for the guards and administrators, more tax dollars to be appropriated, more authority over others to be distributed, etc. and so on. It seems that women would be easier to manage than men given the same general conditions of confinement, but this is not the case. Women can be hard to handle in captivity, often more so than men. Women are typically not as physically strong as men, but they tend to be more ruthless, especially when the tempering effect of kids and family and society are removed from their lives. Women also have a greater capacity to get their shit together once they decide to apply themselves to that goal. Nevertheless, it is distressing to see so many women wearing handcuffs, belly chains, and shackles. It does not seem right. These are not some frothing at the mouth maniacs. These are our mothers, sisters, and neighbors. We hit some strong wind currents and the plane jumped straight up and down, probably hundreds of feet each way, and shifted from side to side violently. A female U.S. Marshal was standing at the bathroom door watching a female prisoner use the facilities when she was thrown first one way and then the other. They all lost their grips. The marshal woman went to her knees in the aisle and her ward in the restroom came out the door backwards with her pants down. The only thing that kept me from flying around was the seatbelt. I was not the only one who thought we were about to go down in the Gulf of Mexico. I remember thinking, it is a wonder that the wings can stay on under that kind of stress. We recovered somewhat, but had to make an emergency landing at Laredo, Texas, because one of the engines was malfunctioning. They had to take us over to the Laredo County Jail and try to find enough room there to put us all up for the night. Uh, us men ended up on the roof for a time while jail officials tried to get it straightened out. I could look across and see Mexico right there, not more than a mile or so away. The weather was warm and a bit overcast, and I was thinking about escape. The roof was only covered by cyclone-type fencing and looked compromised in some places along the edge of the wall. All I needed to do was to find a weak spot, unravel the wire, and crawl up through. I could then find some way to climb down the side of the building, wires, drain pipes, ledges, and take off. It seemed like a godsend of an opportunity, and I intended to make the most of it. The Colombian dude came back into the picture when the jail personnel began ex ex escorting prisoners off of the roof. There was a row of three bathroom stalls against the far wall, and I eased over that way and slid inside one of them and squatted on the toilet with my feet pulled up. After a time, it seemed that the prisoners and guards had all left. If I had any luck at all, they would not come back. But when I put my feet down and stuck my head up to look around, I saw the Colombian dude coming out of the stall at the far end. We did not need to say anything to one another at that moment because we both had the exact idea in mind. We wanted to escape. So we sneaked around the perimeter of the roof area looking for a place where we could get through. The staircase door opened and jail guards began pulling mattresses onto the roof and laying them out. They were soaked with blackish water and sounded heavy to drag. I froze in place, as did Columbia, and the guards went out to get more mattresses. 
This is when we booked back to the toilet stalls and hid there, side by side, with our feet up. Unfortunately, one of the guards came over and looked in. I immediately got up and pretended to fiddle with my pants. I think Columbia did the same. It was an awkward moment. The guard thought that me and Columbia had remained behind to share a homosexual encounter, because that was the way it would have looked to me. They took us inside and put us with the others, and nothing more was made of it. There is something fundamental about longing to be free. Human beings do not take well to chains and cages and subjugation. In fact, they tend to rebel in some way. Usually there is a logical trade-off where a person will put up with it for a time in order to be released from captivity. The easiest definition of freedom is not being held captive by other human beings. The very air a person who is free breathes has a different effect on that person's mental state. There is an exhilaration involved that provides a basic certain power of being that overrides everything else. To come under captivity instantly destroys the inherent reason to be human. It is devastating to the psyche. It does not necessarily advance the better purposes of society. And it is a kind of killing in and of itself. Going into jail or prison seems to imply a type of banishment and a hellish experience. Does any person or system have the kind of moral authority over others to take these drastic measures? The transport plane is back in service. These things fly all over the United States on a daily basis and are only down for a couple of weeks over the Christmas and New Year's holidays. They typically use the penitentiary in Atlanta and El Reno outside of Oklahoma City as holdovers where prisoners are dropped off for a few days before being carried to whatever facility they have been designated to for service of their sentence. The Federal Bureau of Prisons also has buses and vans that make the shorter trips, like from an airport to the prison. I happen to hate all of it with a passion. <laughs>